The John Campia Show, in association with Designing Hollywood, presents... Welcome to the Designing Hollywood Podcast. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. The Designing Hollywood Podcast is dedicated to all things movies, the movie industry, and its talented professionals. Today's episode is sponsored by Paris Costumes. Our guest today is an Oscar-winning British costume designer. She has created the looks of Queens in The Favorite and Shakespeare in Love, Mobsters in The Irishman, Gangs of New York, lush period pieces such as carol for more than three decades she is no stranger to the world of disney other impressive films she has designed that were nominated for best picture the crying game the aviator the departed hugo the wolf of wall street straight out of college she worked on music videos her first job when she was 21 was with choreographer lindsey camp who had taught david bowie but the aspiring costume designer's life would change when she met maverick filmmaker Derek Jarman. It was Jarman who introduced her to set life. Her first film was 1986's Caravaggio, starring Tilda Swinton that he directed. She uses the power of clothes to bring to life some of Hollywood's most unforgettable roles. Her own sense of style is just as memorable. She has said the clothes are always made for characters. The job is not making actors look nice in clothes. It's about making actors believable as their characters, about making the story work. Without further ado, it is our great pleasure to welcome Academy Award winning costume designer Sandy Powell to the Designing Hollywood show. Sandy Powell, it is a great honor to speak with you today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. You have a very uh, uh, a very academic background. You you've studied quite a bit before you got into this. You didn't just jump in. And um one of the things that I, I I'm a proponent of and I think a lot of the people that have been on the show would say that that having a a an academic background and studying art studying design is crucial to getting where you where where what you've done where you are do you think that's true and do you think that uh, an academic background even now is important yes i went to i went to art school i i spent 3 years in art school i did a foundation course and 2 years of um a course which was theater design at the time and then i dropped out <laughs> the bad <laughs> so you're, so I'm just, you're you're a yeah. punk rocker <laughs> yeah i'm dropped out in 1980 81 i did not i did not complete my course i did not get a degree i did not graduate but i went with the intention of learning about theater design and costume design and i learned a little bit enough to know that i wanted to drop out and actually go and work in the theater as opposed to sort of be told by people how to do school so I'm sorry to sort of um, ruin your illusion, but I don't, would never describe myself as an academic. I think I've learned more. I learned more in the first three weeks out of college than I did in three years in. You have to have a vision, don't you? Yes, of course, but you can't learn that at college or school. <laughs> you learn that with life and experience. And I, I really do honestly believe that you learn more just by getting out there and doing it than you do actual study. Now that's not to say that the colleges are important. Of course they are introduce a lot of people to things they wouldn't normally know about or be interested in but i think the most the most valuable part is actual experience that said how do you jump in and 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 grab that i mean you you your your career is astonishing and and what i what i love about it like when i was growing up derek jarman uh, as an american living in seattle uh, I, I would go to the Seattle International Film Festival. I was not somebody who knew who Derek Jarman was, hmm. but but seeing his films uh, were very, I mean, very transcendent. It was not something that I was familiar with, and uh, you know, I was younger, and 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 in the mid '80s, I was in high school, going to college, and when you jumped in to 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 seeing these kinds of things, they really opened my perspective. And how was it? that you came to work with Derek Jarman? 
extraordinarily lucky, but I mean, I live in London and he lived in London. Um, and I was, I'd done a couple of years, I left college and I went straight to work with some people from the theatre who I had met. Admittedly, I had met some people who came to teach for a couple of weeks while I was at college. And I called them up and I said, is there anything to do? There was a very small fringe theatre company of which there were many back in the early 80s in London, uh, where there was there was much more funding for experimental work. Right. Um, in what was called fringe theatre in those days. Um, so I contacted these people and said, is there anything I can do? Do you have any any shows coming up? Is there anything I can do? And uh, I helped out on a production for the very first job I ever did. Then about six months later, they offered me the design job on their next production. I mean, there was very fast turnaround back then. So I started doing that and I did that for a couple of years. I also, at the same time, have met Lindsay Kemp, who, as you've in your introduction explained, was a choreographer, dancer, incredible, sort of extraordinary talent, who was responsible for teaching David Bowie and Kate Bush. And I already met him and I, I kind of met him through chance, really. Well, not through chance. He, he was giving a dance class at a, at a, at a dance, uh, dance school and I just turned up and paid my money and did a dance class and then approached him at the end and you know, <laughs> you're a huge inspiration to me you know can I show you my work my little bit that I had a few drawings so cut a long story short I mean we became friends really very luckily and he actually also invited me to Spain and Italy to do you know, with in my first year out of college so I'd, I'd met Lindsay Kemp miraculously done a very a, a kind of small production with him in Italy and I'd worked with a small theatre company and I kind of actually I'm really interested in film as well and when I was working with the theatre company I was designing the sets also and I wasn't so interested in sets I found I was more drawn towards costume and interested in costume and I got Derek Jarman's phone number from somebody I knew a friend of mine who'd met him in a nightclub in town <laughs> And I called him, I cold called him and said, you know, would you like to come to the theatre and see a show that I designed? I'd love you to see it. I'll give you a ticket. And he, he showed up. He came. He was charming. Uh, I went to tea at his house afterwards. And he basically introduced me to the world of film. I no. made it. I'm, I'm making it sound like it's so easy. Well, that and I was going to. And it kind for... of was. I was just lucky. I think I was in the right place at the right time. And actually both Derek and Lindsay were people who, really enjoyed the company of young people mm. and enjoyed and what they both did. And I'm, I'm really recognizing that now realizing that is what they did was they, they found it really, it really important to pass on, you know, to pass on what they know, but that I think they also were inspired and energized by the energy of younger people. So I was just really blessed to have been uh, mentored by two incredibly generous artists. In this day and age, would you still recommend that for people that are aspiring into the industry? Because I know things have changed I mean, a bit. No, it, it it has, and it is. I mean, because I, I tell this story, I just call you up, and and obviously calling is not a good idea these days. I mean, you know, back then it was. You know, you might have to wait a few days to get a response because you might have to leave a message on an answer machine. You know, there wasn't any other way. Write a letter. Um, sure. I, but I would always say, make yourself known to somebody. I mean, I've employed, I've employed people recently, straight out of college, who are people who have just made themselves known to me, who have, for one reason or another have, have grabbed my interest. Mm. It might be how they look. It might be how they are. There'd be something interesting about them. I said, okay, I'll, I'll give you a go. And I think that's how it, how it works. Well, you know, you, you work with Neil Jordan a lot and, mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, from the crying game, which I mentioned, of course, I am a huge, I was a huge Ann Rice fan. And mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, the idea that, that they were making interview with a vampire was something that I was like, wow, because for me, interview with a vampire was such a cult novel when I was. So, so were you worried about the thought of making a film in case it didn't you know, match up to your. No, because I was already a fan of 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 Neil Jordan's, and and there was a people forget that there was a lot of controversy about Tom Cruise playing Lestat. Yeah, and and while I was like, 
the funny thing is I always trust filmmakers. I'm like, they see things that we don't know. I mean, it's like, <laughs> oh my God, Heath Ledger's going to play the Joker. How can he do that? Like, so when, when Tom Cruise was, was cast, I was like, clearly Neil Jordan, I, I, I will trust in Neil Jordan. And when I saw that film, which by the way, to this day, I, I love Interview with the Vampire. I think it's great, but the costumes, my God, <laughs> G, uh, you, you know, it, it was, and, and and being somebody, that book came out, in the, I think it came out in 1976, and I had read it like three or four times, and then Vampire Lestat came out. But why they didn't make the Vampire Lestat right away is one of the great mysteries of life. I don't, <laughs> don't know. Uh, but my God was that film sumptuous and I, the costumes, the way I, I was like, man, this was right off the page. And I, I, I'm curious, you know, when you, when you're tasked with, with something like this, where does it begin for you? When you're, when you, when you were given a project, uh, I hear that, well, it begins with the script. Do you read the novel? Does it begin in your dreams? Hmm. And I, I, I only because that, going through your filmography uh, before we get to Martin Scorsese or whatever, th that film to me personally, man, was I blown away by that movie. And part of it was, I, you can't look at that film without being like, if I was a vampire, I would dress just <laughs> that. How does something like that begin for you? Oh goodness, and now I have to cast my mind back. I haven't seen the film for years, years and years. And I've been thinking, and a couple of other people have recently mentioned it to me, having seen it, they've, they've sort of watched it recently again and, and said that they've really noticed things they didn't notice before and really enjoyed it. So I do intend, this is one I do intend to watch it again. That's not gonna be possible. Um, but it was in fact my first studio film. It was the first wow. film okay. on that scale that I'd done. So prior to that, the biggest thing I'd done Right at the first before was the crying game. The last film I did with Neil Jordan was the crying game, uh, which was very, very small. Mm. Um, and at the time, contemporary, it looks like a period film now. It looks, it looks like a film from the late 80s, early 90s now, but it, at the time it's a contemporary film. Then follow, and I immediately followed that with Orlando, which was a sort of costume, you know, costumey, sumptuous looking film, but on a on a very small budget. Sure. So Interview with a Vampire was the first time I had a budget to speak of, you know, and a much bigger and everything was a much huger scale. So in a way, it was actually it was actually quite terrifying to begin with. I mean, the only the good thing was that I knew Neil and I'd already done two films with him prior. So I had that connection, which was would have been really, really awful or, or really intimidating to me. I had not known him. Um, it was my first film. I had to employ an assistant who was much more experienced than myself, who had done films on that scale. So I had help in, in terms of organization and administration. How it came about, I, do you know, I, I really don't know. I can only assume it's the same way, it's the same system that I use on every film, which is the script, of course, I read the book, because I thought it was important to read the book as well read the book, read the script about it, discussed with Neil. And I guess just had to get on and start doing the research and coming up with the images. And I can't remember. I seriously can't remember. It's, it's the same, you know, I had a team of, I had a tea, I had a workroom and, and a really, really fabulous cutter. And it was the first time I'd worked with her. And that was the start of a really fabulous relationship. And she did many films with me. Um, I think it was this film was probably one of the few that I actually did have to produce drawings because it was a studio and Tom Cruise and what's he going to look like? And <laughs> I was relatively unknown. You know, I was a relatively known designer and like, well, what's Tom, Tom Cruise going to look like? So I think I had to do element of drawing of like, this, this is the kind of shape he's going to be wearing in this period. Then we jumped to the period. This is the kind of shape he's going to be wearing there. And the same for, for the pit character. Um, and then pretty much you just basically have to get down and start making clothes and doing fittings. And then as soon as you've done a fitting with your actor, 
if they're happy, and if Tom's happy, and presumably he was, I, I think he must have been happy, then everybody's happy. Oh, well, That's how it happened. But I can't tell you any more than that. I can't, like, actually cannot remember. I don't know. I can't remember. Well, let me just say, uh, as somebody who recently watched the film, the, the clothes are sumptuous. I mean, I, you know, if, if, if I was one of the undead and was an immortal, uh, I would call you and ask you to make my clothes. I guess, I guess somehow he must have had a lot of money because they were sumptuous and they were made from expensive fabrics and we did make them look healthy. So I can't remember how he actually made his money. How does he make his money? <laughs> Maybe well, just, you know, they, they, they invest. You invest when you're an immortal, and a hundred years later, the, the the. I guess that's it. Yeah, it really. I can't remember. Yeah, how you know, you know or so where he great. bought his clothes, or who, who made his clothes. Where did he get them from? We don't know, do we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he buys them at Savile Row. That's where he gets them. You know <laughs> yeah. why not? Well, of of course, you know. Then you went on to do f- things like Velvet Goldmine, my God, and 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 then Shakespeare yeah. in Love, which of course won the the Best Picture at the Oscars. And, you know, I, I find that Shakespeare in Love is a movie that I, again, was enchanted by. I love that film. Shakespeare mm-hmm. in Love is, is monumentally entertaining. Mm-hmm. And, and again, you know, you both have to, you, you had to recreate what it was like to work in the Globe Theater at the time. And then you also have to dress Judy Dench. And, yeah. uh, when you when you take on a project like that, uh, what is your process? Do you do you research the period, or do you dispense with all that and go with your gut? No, you absolutely. If something's set in the period, you always start by researching the period. I mean that you you have to research the period and see as much as you can about how it should be, how it should be, or what it would be, or how it could be. You know, you you have all of that information, and then depending on the project decide what to, how to use that information what to do with it whether to sort of think okay I'm going to try and um, approach this and be as historically accurate as possible or I'm just going to take elements of this as inspiration and then go off on a tangent and do my own thing now the thing about Shakespeare in Love was that even though it was about real people in a real time in a real place but it's a comedy and it's entertainment so it's all a bit it's a little bit heightened you know all of it is a little it was a lot of artistic license it, it was a bit sort of like if you were actually doing theater piece at the time you know um but yeah pretty much it's it pretty much as much as possible it was historically accurate there were no anachronisms there were no sort of modern touches or anything um but yeah and i, I sort of had to in mind that actually this was and that's what was so great about it, that it was it was it was light-hearted it was it's entertainment it's a comedy so i think and i had within that there were a lot of really great characters good funny strong characters and so that was the interesting that's the interesting thing. and actually it's not so easy when you've got something like a um, elizabethan period to do character within that you know because the shapes are the shapes we were wealthy they're pretty the silhouettes are pretty much the same so it's quite interesting working out the little foibles and little details that define a character. well it, it was interesting after you did that i mean when it w- were you surprised that that film won the academy award i was because i was up against um, Elizabeth, right, <laughs> the same year with Kate Blanchett, who was extraordinary playing Elizabeth the first in a film that looked really gorgeous, like Alex, Alexandra Burns' costumes were like fantastic, and I was convinced of him because it was the serious, it was the serious film about a historical figure, and it looked gorgeous. Mine was the comedy, Kate's <laughs> the comedy. Well, there's no the comedy's not going to win over the you know Kate Blanchett being serious as Elizabeth the first. Um, so yeah, I was surprised, and I, it was also a strange year for me because that Velvet Goldmine was nominated the same year. Right, which was I was I up mean... against myself, and I loved that film. <laughs> I loved working on it, and I loved how it looked, and so it was it was difficult, you know, it was difficult. But then... yeah, so in answer to your question. Yes, I was very surprised I won the Shakespeare Love. Oh, I mean, it. I, I, I have to say, I, I don't know why I've had to defend that film's victory, but I was like, no, no, no. That was the best picture of the year. I mean, in terms of what a movie does, 
and you know it was up against as an all-rounder yeah as all-round entertainment that yes i think it won the best picture yeah you know i always think that uh when when films in my mind when people ask me a question they're like well, uh, rob how are you going to do that I, i'm like it's a mystery yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's and, i mean to this to this day so i'm like that movie was great in my mind, it's I love that film so much. It's so much, it's so much fun, beautifully done. And then you began a long association with Martin Scorsese and and uh uh that that how did you meet him? How did you come to work with Martin Scorsese? He um it was just after I'd won the Academy Awards Prize, Shakespeare in Love. Um I got a message that he wanted to meet me and did I want to read his script for Gangs of New York which was being shot in Europe. Yeah, so, in Italy, right? In Rome, yeah. So I guess it was, they, they were looking for a European designer for that. So um, that's how that happened. I got asked if I wanted to read the script to meet him. So, of course, I said yes. Please. The thing about, uh, again, a film that, that <laughs> I love that a film about New York was being shot in Italy, but again... <laughs> The design work, I, I guess the word again is sumptuous. I mean, you 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 had Daniel Day Lewis as Bill the Butcher, you had Leonardo DiCaprio, you had a very specific period of time. But what one of the things I love about that film is it feels very heightened. It feels that it's from it. it it's yes, it's a period piece, but it also feels like you're watching in a way almost a science fiction movie where mm. how, how tied do you feel to period when you're working on something like gangs in New York, is it important to represent the period accurately or do you get to bring a sense of design and, and be a little more theatrical with it and uh, maybe uh, go beyond what yeah. people of the day would wear in this particular, I was at to do both so most of the film takes place in the downtown area of new york which was called the five points at the time um and marty actually specified that he wanted that to be a little world of its own it was sort of separate from everywhere else therefore it could kind of look it could have its own look and its own feel so it was sort of inventing a world within that period we were around 1840 to 1860 is when it was mm. set you might recall in the scenes when they actually leave that world and go uptown, everything looks a lot more conventional. I mean, that's where people are walking around in like conventional women are walking in the lens, and, you know, and then you know you see horse-drawn carriages and and sort of normal life um, in the smarter part of town is more historically accurate. That's not to say that what we did do wasn't historically accurate but there was as you say a little bit of artistic license it was pushed a little bit visually it was it was pushed and slightly stylized um loved it by the way in order, to, in order for it to have a look of, of a world on its own which was a, a a brilliant challenge and a very exciting thing to do well when you start something like that and and you're dealing with period and then also you want to like like you said push it how do you start? I mean, is the research important? Do you are you sourcing fabrics that are of the period? How much reality is important to you? Well, the research, like going back to what we were saying before, the research, the actual research is very important. The things that you look at, you know, there are paintings, but but this was the the time of early photography, so there was a lot of photographic reference and images, which was great. Um, daguerreotypes. And there were actually daguerreotypes, photographs of um, ordinary people, because mostly you normally get portraits, portraits, painted portraits were usually of wealthy people. So as soon as photography came in, you then got access to portraits of people who weren't particularly wealthy. So you got mm. to see what ordinary people wore. So the research, the actual gathering together of information and imagery is very important and very, you know, really vital part and, and one of the most interesting aspects of the job in terms of sourcing fabrics from the period that's pretty impossible you know i mean you know if you were buying fabric 19th century you can buy fabrics from the 19th century but they'd be really small pieces and the chances are they'll be brittle and fall apart so i used fabrics that obviously you can only use the fabrics that are accessible and and, and produced now in contemporary times and 
you know, you have to use fabrics that look like they they could have been from that period. I mean, you, natural fibers, obviously wools and cottons. I mean, people always have wools and cottons and silks. So that's pretty much what you use. And then you treat them and make them look as much as you can, as if they've come from another time. Sure. And and when doing that, I mean, you had that that movie has a cast of hundreds of people. <laughs> I mean, it, it was huge. I think it was so huge. I think if I'd actually thought about it at the time, I'd have been so terrified. I couldn't have done it. We just had to sort of go blindly into it and just keep going. And it grew as we went along, changing constantly. And the film just seemed to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the and the and the shoot actually went on longer and longer and longer. It went on much longer than it should have done. So right. it just kept expanding and we just had to sort of keep, you know, running to keep up. Now, of course, one of the great things about that particular film is you you have Daniel Day Lewis as Bill the Butcher. And mm-hmm. that what's it like for you when you work with I've I've often said on this show that the first line of defense for any movie is that one of the you have to hire great hair and, and makeup people and also the costume designer because actors you have to make sure an actor knows that they look great when they yeah. walk out onto set. It 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 it, it, it is uh, an actor cannot think about they have to they have to have their character they're carrying it with them, and yes. and for what you do, um, is is incredibly important. More people don't even understand how important that is for an actor. Um, Bill the Butcher had such a great look. Now, when you're working with a with a with a director and an actor, what is that process like for you in terms of developing character? That was an interesting one because Marty was quite specific about how he wanted Bill the Butcher to look. He wanted him to look dandified, like a peacock, even though what his job was a butcher, and he wouldn't normally think of that as somebody who dressed up. That's what he wanted him to look like. It's a bit like a traditional gangster, you know, where they, you know, they they want to look good. That's part of the it's part of the intimidation of somebody who is who is dressed meticulously um, and sort of showily, really, in a way. That so, Marty, we had already discussed that. Um, then I met Daniel for the first time and let him tell me what he thought and his idea was the complete opposite <laughs> which, was, which was like oh I think you should be really grimy and really down and really you know like really lived in and you know I mean, the opposite so I was like okay right <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> Mr Scorsese uh suggested that maybe so I mean pretty much what I had to do I said well look, why don't we try why don't we just try both let's see what works and why don't we start by making you some shapes we'll make some prototype shapes for you to try on and we'll take it from there and see how it develops I mean it's an organic process anyway I would never I would never meet an actor with a drawing with a design and say this is what you're wearing right never because you don't know until you actually meet them you see them face to face physically or in, and even until you start trying things on you still don't know what it's going to be until a few things down the line right because because it, it's an organic process things change things develop things move people's ideas change um so that's what we did we we i went away i'm having seen him looked at him and i thought you know his, his stature and all the rest of it i thought well, i want to make him i want to make him taller i want to make it you know i want to make ex, ex, sort of accentuate his long slender form so I made the top hat a bit taller than it would have been. The trousers a bit skinnier than they would have been. And from the first fitting, which was literally just some some shapes, I mean, not in the fabrics or the colours that it was going to be, just the silhouette. He put it on and he got it and he liked it and he felt it. So I thought, okay, you, that's it. Okay, we're halfway there. Well, I, I, I mean, again, another indelible character design that 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 his costumes, the way he looked, was so important to that that character and when you're yeah. when you're doing something like that you know like you said when you have a director tell you one thing and then an actor walks in and says no 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 yeah, well, well, this is the way i see it you kind of mm. have to put on your your psychologist hat you then suddenly are yeah caught between a rock and a hard place mm-hmm. what do you do then like like how do you as a costume designer you know you're you're in a way you're a therapist and you're a cheerleader and 
uh, how do you nice. how do you reconcile what the director might want to what an actor might want make that all work without having all I, I guess it depends it depends on your relationship with those people it depends on whether your relationship with the director is, is there and strong and you know them very well and, and you and, and if you actually agree with the director and believe them and then you hear the actor's point of view and it might be that you have to sort of gently persuade the actor to come around or they might they might have very valid points that I might have to go back to the director and say well they think this I mean what I always do is get you into some clothing as quickly as possible let's actually rather than talking about it and looking at it on bits of paper in 2D let's just make something and get it on and see how it feels and see how it looks and see how it moves and then we'll discuss it again later that's that's how i take i mean basically psychologists yes that's what you do the entire time the right. whole time the minute you meet somebody for the first time you've got to you've got to very quickly you've got to sum them up physically up, you know look at them you've got to you've got to figure out everything about them very early on especially their 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 neuroses <laughs> <laughs> and they all have everybody has them we all do um, and it's just getting it's getting into that. And then and then really the most important thing is making somebody feel comfortable and making them confident in you, making them feel like you're doing your best to help them with their character and make them look how they are happy to look and how the director wants them to look. Well, I mean, and, and you began a long, a long and very fruitful uh, collaboration with Martin Scorsese on 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 so many films. Hmm. which where you 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 did a lot of things i mean whether it was hugo whether it was wolf of wall street when you have a relationship an ongoing relationship with a director i mean you're two artists two collaborators how does that collaboration begin and how do you continue to collaborate with a director uh i suppose i'm trying to think of i mean it begins obviously with a lot of talking and you certainly do. I mean, in the, you know, and, and then someone like Mark Scorsese's time is very limited because there are so many people who he needs to talk to, or any director for that matter, has to talk to all the all the heads of department. Um, but you do get an awful lot in conversation with Mark Scorsese. You know, you have an hour with him, and he will just like bombard you with information so much, and it's really difficult to to take it all in and remember it. All you have to, I'm usually have somebody with me so that they. Can, <laughs> they can then remind me of it. Take notes. Of said. Yeah, exactly. Um, there is that. And then, of course, the longer, the, the, the more projects you do with each other, the less you have to talk. I mean, obviously, you have the initial conversations about the concept and the vision and all the rest of it. But you don't have to discuss every tiny little detail necessarily. Because, again, it's about mutual trust. Sure. Well, what is that like? I mean, when you do your initial designs, do you sketch? Do you draw? I don't actually. No, I don't. I mean, this is. I don't. I. Uh, I. I sketch or draw for whoever is making the costume if they need me to do that. If I, sure. I and I do it for myself, maybe just work something out in my head. But it's not anything that I would show to a director or an actor. It won't look like them it won't look like anything they recognize as clothing only i understand it and the, and the technicians that i'm working with will understand it it would take me it would the reason i don't do a drawing of a costume is because i actually don't know what it's going to look like till we start doing it I know a that's shape. interesting i know a shape i know a color so what i usually start with what i normally show a director if i'm you know about this is this is this character i have reference images that I use that are, that I, that I like for whatever reason. I might like a particular coat in a in a painting, or I might like a car. I might just like the feeling. I might like the essence of, or whatever this picture is. But I'll have quite a lot of images for each character. I will then collect fabrics. I then start looking at fabric colors. I'll then have a color palette and various fabrics and textures. That's it. I'll say this is it. This is the world. And you know, if you have a visual director. They understand sometimes they don't and i say well i will show you the fitting pictures as soon as i have them as soon as i have something as soon as i have an example or you know or a prototype on that actor we will look at the fitting pictures together and then we can talk through it but quite often now i mean they don't actually see the costumes until they're finished and on the actor I mean, wow you know, it's, i i don't actually do the drawings I, it would take it would take up too much of my time to do a beautiful drawing 
And I find it really difficult working with sketch artists. I know a lot of designers work with sketch artists. And depending on the project you do, you have to work with sketch artists if you're working on those big concept movies. Well, of course. <laughs> you know which actually i don't do but the people who work on those obviously have to work with sketch artists. everybody wants to know what it's going to look like um right <laughs> those specialty costumes you know those those ones i like superhero things and all of that yeah of course i have to be interested and i would and if i was doing one of those i'd have to work with somebody who would do that kind of drawing I mean, i can draw i do my own style but it wouldn't be the kind that would that would you know pass any any tests of on, on a marvel for instance right sure well, I, 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 it, it's to me. I, I find it fascinating because everybody works a little differently, and yeah. and to me, costumes don't really matter until you actually see them on an actor. Exactly, you know, it's it's a tangible physical thing. You, it has to be in three D, and I just think so often drawings, drawings are great. Drawings can give you a feeling of what something's going to be like. But I think I can provide other visual references for that feeling. I can provide the same thing without having to draw sort of a bit like what that person's going to look like. Mm. I uh, much prefer working in 3D. Well, I, and absolutely. And, and the work you've done, I mean, with Mrs. Scorsese, you've done so many different kinds of things. Again, like mm. Hugo was a incredibly, again, the word sumptuous, all of your work, the word sumptuous comes to mind but when you're working on something like hugo now that was a film that was actually shot in 3d and it's a yeah. period piece and there was there was lots of uh uh, uh visual effects and, and and things like that when you approach a film in that way do you do anything differently or is I costume think- design always the same that film was the first time actually the first and only time i did 3d and actually, we did have to pay particular attention to, to detail here because, you know, you realize that if there was just a little stray thread somewhere, it would look like a, you know, a piece of rope, 3D, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You had to really be careful. So that's yeah. the only thing. It was just be really, very, a speck of anything could be, you know, in, in, in the frame because it would just be magnified a thousand times. But I treated that film the same as any other period film. I mean, that that was a film that was pretty, pretty straightforward period film with proper, yeah, with as much as possible, possibly historically accurate. It, what that one was, that was a, even though it's a fantastical story, um, it was sort of based in in absolute reality. Absolutely. I mean, and uh, I think uh, what makes it look sumptuous as a film is you've got Dante Ferretti, the designer who is, is operatic in his scale. And then Bob Richardson, the cinematographer, who just lights beautifully. And I always use, I'm a big fan of color and I use a lot of color. And I think all of those elements combined make, you know, give you sumptuousness. Now, were you a fan of cinema growing up? Did you watch a lot of movies? Yes, I did, yeah. I think oh, movies, yeah, absolutely. Did you have favorites? Remember. Did what 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 were some of your touchstones when you were when when you were growing up? What were some of your favorite films? I mean, very young. The first film I saw was Mary Poppins, I believe. So, Mary Poppins, Sound of Music. I wasn't interested in animation, wow. so I wasn't brought up. I wasn't brought up with the Disney's at all, even though I'm now working on them on the live action versions. I never saw them as a child. Um, I think the films that had the most profound effect on me were the ones I started seeing as a young teenager. So from about 12 to 40, 12 to 16, I think, were the films from the, the early 70s were the ones that I really loved. And they were always, they were quite grown up at the time. I mean, I remember yeah. seeing Cabaret as a 12 year old. Um, even the Night Port, to Lucy. But the night was, porter i saw the night porter i know i can't believe i saw i would i looked quite grown up when i was young i know <laughs> you're like i'm just a big charlotte rampling fan it's gonna go <laughs> I in know. i do remember seeing that yeah i know i can't believe it Death great in movie Venice. though by the way i mean yeah no visconti and bertolucci i loved as a teenager and that was that that was the first films that drew me into costume in film you know Wow, uh, Visconti and Bertolucci. There, there's a there's a duo. 
Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 12. I'm going to see the new Visconti film, uh, which is fantastic. <laughs> I was a little bit older than I, I was six when I saw it in Furnace. About seven <laughs> times, though. Wow. Now, now, so uh, being a narrative of, of cinema, what what were some of the things like in terms of in terms of costume design, what you do now? Were there any other touchstones like singular films? Uh, look, I'm a huge Bob Fosse fan. For me, I, I'm I'm a film editor and uh, all that jazz oh, made me want to edit movies. And I, yeah. I, I it was the first time I was like. I was the first time I was aware of editorial, but what were some of the, 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 the films that you'd watched where you, you looked at costume design or like, Oh my God, that's, that's it, man. That I was it. Do- Death in Venice. Anything that Visconti did that Rotosi designed. Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, Death Met Cabaret. You know, I love both of those. I'm trying to think what else. Um, well, I mean, of- Cabaret, as far as costume design, it's an amazing film. Yeah. I loved, I liked, I liked either, being, I suppose I, I have always gone for grandeur or, or either dark, either sort of dark and, uh, you know, a cabaret, rocky horror show, you know what I mean? That sort of similar, a rock show is a bit late in the 70s, but sort of, I mean, even, even Death in Venice is beautiful period, but the hats are enormous, you know, it's just sort of, I think <laughs> I like things on a, a, a larger scale. Well, there is, there is sort of a heightened, uh, sensibility that you have that that uh, very uh, a little bit more theatrical well I think that comes from my theater my theater background really I think that's how I, I started designing with theater in mind and I think that's what happened when I when I moved into film I took a bit of the theater with me obviously it's that I don't design theatrically all the time because I'm aware that you know we're being us up we're not looking for the back row um but there is always that it's it's sort of um Maximum impact. Oh, I, I, I love it. I mean, you know, movies, <laughs> there's one, there's one school of thought that says, okay, we, we have to recreate things exactly, but movies inherently are dreams They're They have to be hype. They have to have, a, that's, you know, when I watched interview with a vampire, you gave me what I wanted from those characters. And I, I was like, yes, that's, that's how they would dress because if you were part, if you were the undead, if you were Lestat, <laughs> he's not going to wear bad clothes. I mean, he's okay. going to wear the best clothes. He's like, yo, man, I'm hundreds of years old. I'm not going to, I'm not going to wear something unless it's the most beautiful. And he, and he also has to go around charming people, charming yes. everybody. He has, to yes. be a, he has to be attractive to everybody. Everyone. And, and, you know, nowadays, of course, if you're Patrick Bateman from American Psycho and you're wearing your beautiful clothes or whatever uh nowadays i don't know if people know like i don't know anything i i am not a fashionista i wish it's my blind spot in life i and 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 i know my problem is i would love if i was in that i would want to wear the best clothes i couldn't afford them Mm -hmm. i want to spend money on on independent movies like let i but you your work whenever you look at any of the work that you've done whether it's a period piece or something modern my god i look at your 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 work and i just think that's expensive <laughs> i couldn't afford to wear that but that's <laughs> why i love it that's what the movies are all about and you 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 bring that that sensibility to to the screen i mean when a character that you've dressed walks in they look like a million bucks even if they're in the five points and everything's dirty and they're a butcher yeah yeah, I hope they don't look too good all the time because that is that is the you know the point that you do all have to do the people who look bad. Well, I think they look good on the screen to be the yes. characters. That I think that's yeah, yeah. that's your great. You no, know, no, your you great, can still yeah, you can still make the dirt beautiful. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's a big, you know, yeah. uh, that's a big thing to, to do, and and uh, it, it, I think in a way. It's an art form that might sort of be lost, although it's coming back because with streaming services like Netflix, there's a lot of period pieces being made. Oh, I know. It's where all the period. I mean, there are, no, there are not so many period films being made anymore, but it, I know that they're all coming out on the, yeah, on streaming. Yes, it, it, it's, it doesn't matter whether, and, and, and they're playing fast and loose with periods now. 
Like it definitely that that is the trend, isn't it? Yeah. And why do you think that is? I, I think it's it's what producers have always wanted when you do period films. I mean, in my in my time, sure. They always want to have a modern element or to have something that attracts. They they think that people won't be attracted to a period film unless they can relate to it. Therefore, it's either got to have modern dialogue or it's got to have, and I was asked as a producer whether, you know, on Shakespeare in Love, as to whether Joe Fiennes would, you know, did he really have to be wearing those britches? Could he not be wearing trousers? You know what I mean? Could he not be wearing full length pants because they thought, they thought that, that those shaped Elizabeth things were a bit silly. It was like, no, we're doing a period film. Let's, you know, it's, so there's always been an element of let's do it. Let's, you know, and especially also with hair and makeup, you know, that in a period film, so often you see women with their hair down in a very modern, you know, where it would never be down, it would be up. All of right. that. It's always been popular. People always think that, that it, it, in order to be popular, they have to be relevant to now, um, which is sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, I, you know, I think some things work really brilliantly and if it's done well and cleverly, it can work. Other times I just think it looks a bit shoddy and doesn't work. Yeah, I, I, it's now. Weird. It's for now. It's it's definitely there is a style now that it's worked for a couple of the first series of things that were successful. Now what's happening is everybody's just using the same formula that works. Let's just copy it, and then it becomes boring. Yes, I I I agree. But you know what wasn't boring? Mary Poppins Returns. <laughs> uh, I, I you know I grew up, I people always ask me about some of my favorite fantasy films and they're always shocked when I say, well, Mary Poppins, I think Mary Poppins is one of the great fantasy films of all time. And the idea that someone's going to come back. I mean, first of all, Emily Blunt, uh, amazing. Well, and when, perfect. Awesome. Uh, uh, perfect. And, and I, I was enchanted by Mary Poppins Returns. I don't think that there was a, a movie that I, I I was gritting my teeth to see, like, how dare you? Yes. And and uh, uh, why would you do something like this? And uh, you you pulled it off. I mean that that film deserves, I think, even more credit than it got. When when you when you're tasked with recreating one of the yeah. most iconic, one of the most favorite one of the most memorable movies of all time. Do you run away screaming in terror? Or just take the money and oh, whatever. You, no, I mean, it was, it was Rob Martin last me himself. And it was, you know, it was like, you want to do it? And it was like, uh, of course I do. You know, <laughs> of course I do. It's Rob Marshall. And I'd never done a musical and it's Mary Poppins. But then, and then the next thought was like, Oh my God, how the hell am I going to do this? Not, you know, disappoint everybody. But, you know, it's good to have a challenge. No, on one hand, yes, it, it was like, this, this could be a disaster. This could be really difficult. But, I, you know, I couldn't say no. I wouldn't uh, say I, no. I, I loved it. I mean, I, uh, I, I thought what you guys did with that film yeah. was, it, it was miraculous. I, I think it's a beautiful film. I really do. I think it works on all levels. I completely agree. But, mm. man, that had to be, I, I mean, I, I would have been terrified. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't have done it. I'm like, if I was you in your place, there's no way, <laughs> you know. But you, you know what? It's it's often it's good to be terrified. Though. It's good to be. I mean, if you were complacent, oh yeah, I can do that. That's easy. You're not going to push yourself. You can. You can. Yeah, you could do something that looks all right and looks quite good. But I think you've got to have a bit of fear all the time, every time, to push yourself further. And I think you, you know, I think you can achieve much more with a little bit of terror. Behind you. <laughs> <laughs> well now i mean now you're working on snow white uh -huh. and and again we're if working for disney um it, it's interesting to me that they have taken uh this this t to to recreate their uh, i mean snow white was the very first animated feature film yeah and and it is arguably one of the most iconic between Snow White and and the Wicked Witch, uh, in in Western culture, the canon of Western culture, I know. Like like <laughs> these characters are some of the most indelible and iconic 
characters ever. And I think, boy, did you get, did you get the perfect person to play Snow White? I mean, after oh, watching did. West Side Story, it's like, my God. And and so when yeah, you and I can I can vouch for that for sure. She is perfect cast. Oh, and uh, we, we, we were only three weeks with we two and a half weeks before the end of the shoot. So I've seen it all. It's, um, she's well, when casting. you're when you are given this job, I mean, obviously Academy Award nominations and all that. You obviously know that the industry. The industry has faith in you, however. When you get tasked to do Snow White, is there any, do you get scared? Do you're like, what am I going to do? I, or I can just copy the animation. What is your process? I mean, you're, my God, these are those two characters. I mean, I, in my yeah. mind, if someone says the Wicked Witch, it is the witch from Snow White. That's it. That's, that's the, in, in, in Western canon, there's like Jesus Christ, and then there's the witch from Snow White. <laughs> I mean, what do you do? Like, do you, do you take it on and just how do you begin that process and how do you make it your own? I don't know how to say without giving too much weight, but similar to the, the doing Cinderella as well with her is, you know, I obviously look at the original and I you, you have to use elements you you know you, there, there's obviously there's a nod there's a nod all the way to the original there's an homage to the original but then it's my version and this I say contemporary modern looking but it's it's a new version it's a reinvention of the same story and the same characters that's all right. I can tell you right now I can't, I can't tell you anymore <laughs> but um <laughs> well I mean if you want if you want look I had to stay away from from Cinderella because I have to say for me, again, I got dragged to see Cinderella. I'm like, come on. <laughs> okay, first of all, I don't know where Lily James came from. Uh, I don't think, again, perfect casting. Lily James as Cinderella was the, I mean, seriously. <laughs> and again, great, great, great costumes. And you're, but, but the thing is, I, to me, Cinderella, maybe it's because it, it's not as iconic as Snow White. You know, because maybe it's because Snow yeah. White, mm. because Snow White has a dich Cinderella is is everyone dreams of being a princess and finding their their prince charming, but Snow White is very singular. Maybe, mm. maybe that's what it is. But but so but working for Disney, I mean, going from Derek Jarman to Di if Derek Jarman I was live, I mean, what would he just would he delight in the fact that you're working for Disney, or would he be like? Come on, why are you working for Disney? I don't know. I don't. I mean, I don't know. Um, the thing is, I think what I try to do is I try to keep a balance. I don't just work for Disney and and do that kind of film one after sure. the other. I do no, little ones in between, like the two movies I did. I did two. One, one last year. One uh, the year before. Straight after the. I did two very, very, very small, low budget films. The kind of films that I used to do in the early nineties. <laughs> so very small low budget films working with producers that I used to work with in the early 90s and then, so I balance it I do the sort of art house little budget films alongside the big ones which you know basically it means I can afford to do the, the small little ones you know sure if I want to. Um, so but what would Derek Jarman think? I think he'd find it a hoot, actually. I don't think I don't think he'd resent anybody doing a bit, you know, you're, you're being creative and you're putting your own spin on it. And I don't think I'm not actually being dictated to by anybody about what I'm doing. I am I am very lucky and I am pretty much given free reign to do what I think. Obviously, it's within reason. Obviously, I'm not, you know, Snow White's not going to be unrecognizable. Everyone's going to know that that's Snow White. Right. And the same with the, the, the evil uh, stepmother. So. Oh, I mean, it's, 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 it's so, I mean, these things are so iconic and so much fun, but, but also, you know, I, I have to, I, the Wolf of Wall Street, another film <laughs> that, that I, I mean, my God, that movie is so wildly entertaining, yeah. but that film also has great costumes, great suits, great. Jordan Belfort, man, that guy knew how to dress himself, or at least mm -hmm. he knew how to dress himself the way you dressed him. 
And no, he, and- he did actually. He knew he knew to employ the best tailors. And that's what it was about. It was just about it was about employing the best tailors. They used to fly the tailors in from Savile Row. They they come in. They fly them in just to do a whole bunch of fittings and do suits for like the whole you know the office. Wow. So they use they, they use the best tailor. That's all. It was about the money, you know. Yeah, he could afford to do that. So that's so he got good tailoring. Right. Which, I'm which not is- saying he necessarily had good taste, but the clothes were made properly. Well, and and you could see that, and 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 what you did, what you recreated on screen was great. Now let me ask you, you know, you started getting everyone. I think in our culture, you win an Academy Award. I got to ask, I mean, you've been nominated, you've won. What is it like to win an Academy Award for you? <laughs> it's really exciting. I mean, not the, the moment that you do, you're talking about, or you mean like since having them? No, I mean, I think the, the idea, first of all, the idea that you might win one, I mean, it's, it, and, and, then, and then actually, because it, it's all very esoteric. It's not like, you know, there's a rainbow that lands on you from heaven and you walk around in this rarefied mm-hmm. air. But still, I mean, to win an Academy Award, to be nominated for Academy Awards, you've been nominated many times and, and through your work. Is it incongruous for what you do? Like, you know, when you're designing costumes and working with actors and being on set and working with the director and the cinematographer. But then when you get something like the Academy Awards, which is 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 the exact opposite of what it's like to work on a movie. Yeah, it's a very it collaborative process. It's such a weird. <laughs> the Oscars it is, and I think, are so I think, weird. Unfortunately, I think there are a lot of people who, who just assume that because the Academy Awards moment is a, is a moment of glamour. And that is that's the bit of glamour. They assume that your whole life is like that <laughs> and your whole job is like that. And you think, oh, my God, it could not be further from the truth. It could not be less glamorous you know if you could really see you know, follow me around on my daily life in, in my work you know you'd see how unglamorous it is um so it's a little moment of glamour i suppose that's what i mean it's it's very stressful being nominated actually it's really especially you know it yeah it's stressful because then the pressure's on you win and it's like you've been put into this race that you enter yourself in for and you think oh, I, I, you're on the starting line and you and you try to be like you try to say that like, I don't it doesn't matter if I don't win you know, I'm very happy to be nominated but then when you get to the moment of course you want to everybody wants to win you're in that moment you're in the race you want to win you don't want to you know you to say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try I'm not gonna run very fast right um so it's kind of stressful it's stressful in that you don't want to let everybody else down because usually what happens is that everybody around you the people that you that work with you you know because it, it's it's uh, it's for them as well. Sure. Um, and what is excited and, and your friends and your family and everybody's behind you. And you just, oh, what if I don't win? I'm going to disappoint all the, I'm prepared to not win. But you feel really rotten letting everyone else down. So it's kind of a, it's, it's actually quite a stressful time. <laughs> that's not to say I'm ungrateful. I'm not being ungrateful about it. I'm just saying that's what it feels like. It's, it's, it's very weird. Oh, of course, but it's still very cool. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, look. Of course it is. Of course it is. Of course I mean, it's, it's it's really great to be recognised, and and especially by the nominations come from the people who do the same job as you. Yeah, you know, they're, absolutely. They're the people who understand what your job is, and and um, you know, they've they voted. So that's you know, that's the the biggest honour, really. Well, one of the things that we talk about a lot on the show is is when the new generation of people that that. Now we live in a world where there's influencers and there's Instagram and TikTok and there's so yeah. many uh, ways to get your work out there. But one of the great things I think about cinema is it, it, it does require discipline and it does require knowledge and history and understanding to speak to people that might want to get into the business. Is there any advice that you can give how would you tell somebody that's like, you know, going into college that wants to work in film or theater? What advice could you give them? I think the thing is to not think. I, mean, I think the problem is a lot of young people now just think that, I mean, because there are so many reality TV shows where you can enter a competition and be nothing one minute and then suddenly you win and you're a star right. like overnight, literally overnight. I think there are people who think they can come into the industry, come in and then just be 
overnight be at the top of the tree. Do you know what I mean? It's it's not going to happen. I, I think you've got to be prepared to work really hard, long hours, and do anything, things that don't really seem to be particularly relevant. If you want to be a costume designer, you might have to, for a while, be making somebody else's lunch. You know, as a PA or as a trainee, you might have to be doing things that you really boring. But once you're in the environment, you you keep your eyes and your ears open and you learn you know you look and you listen and you ask questions and you learn I think it's, it it doesn't happen overnight you've got to be prepared to to wait and be patient and put the out and do the work well also I mean you know we talked earlier about your academic background you said what what should people do these days I mean is it different I mean do you work on the job do you learn on the job what can people do I think if you have an interest, if you have if you have an interest in costume design, then you learn as much about that as possible. You don't necessarily have to go to college to do that. You can you can be self-taught. I mean, I knew how to sew, I knew how to make things before I went to college. I was brought up learning how to do that. I, I my mother taught me and I taught continue to teach my my own clothes. I think actually understanding how, if you want to design clothes, you have to understand how they're put together and how they're made for you should be able to do it yourself. You don't have to be the greatest tailor in the world or the greatest costume maker in the world, but you should at least have a go and understand mm. how it's made. You should know about fabrics. You should know about, you should be interested in history and research. No, um, I mean, absolutely. You, I mean, I'm not a historian. I don't know. I mean, people, people seem to think I'm a, you know, I know because I know intimate you know, details about costumes from every period. I don't. I know the period that I'm working on. I do the, I do, I research a particular period or a, a particular aspect of a period for the film I'm doing. I learn that. I retain it as much of that information as possible, not all of it. And if I go back to that period again, I have to start again, start learning it again. But you have to learn how to learn. It's good to learn how to learn and what to look at and, and to get inspiration from things. Do you think that, uh, in terms of, of where we're at in the industry, the industry has really changed uh, in the last, I don't know, 30 years. I mean, now we're talking about streaming and the yeah. difference between theatrical. I mean, now we're in a period where Tom Cruise's latest movie is, you've worked with him, he's going to make his, uh, Top Gun Mavericks is going to be the first billion dollar Tom Cruise movie. It's incredible, and isn't it? It, it is. And and uh, I had the honor of meeting him once and we we ended up in a room together just him and I <laughs> we had a conversation for a long time and I, I, it was an incredibly impressive guy I mean in terms of mm -hmm. we just talked about work and um but he talked about the changing industry and this was back in in the late aughts when he had done Valkyrie um do you think the industry is changing or is it is is in terms of your work in terms of costume design like you said period isn't necessarily it's fluid now we can do whatever we want we can make something like bridgerton or we can uh yeah. it doesn't matter it's it, it changing yes it's changing but it's changing because as you say before there, there there are so many more platforms you don't just you know you don't just go into a cinema to see that film you know you have to wait for it to come out you see it in that film for a certain amount of time and then it goes away again. Now you can watch anything anywhere at any time. And there is so much, there is so much content and so many platforms to see it all on. Of course, it's going to change. Of course, it develops. And of course, there's going to be lots of different things. I don't think, for me, what's changed is the, is the, the kind of old fashioned films that are being made. You know, I mean, I used to be really, um, really snooty about doing TV. People would say, would you ever design for TV? I'll go, no, I'm not going to design for something that's that small. You know when TVs were that small. Wow. Okay. I mean, I used to think I don't want to design for something that's really small. I want to design for something that you see in a big, you know, on a massive screen in a big room, in a big dark room. But that wasn't serious. Obviously, now things have changed and TVs have got bigger. You know, you can have one that's your. Yeah, I mean, I get right here. I, I, and, they're great. And also now, of course, some of the best writing is on TV, you know, and, and actually I like the idea. I haven't done any, I haven't done a series yet, but I like the idea of a series because you can develop, a character can develop. The story can be much broader and bigger uh, than it can do in a, in a two, three hour film. So there is all of that, which I think is good. And then the bad side of it is there is also an awful lot of trap <laughs> being made. And you have to sort of wade through the crap to find the good stuff 
So wait a minute. Are you telling me that maybe a, 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 a Maverick producer could could come to you and say, Sandy, it's, you know, uh, I got this show on Netflix or I've got this show. Are you, are you, are you saying you're out there? Are you available for TV? Yeah, if it's the right thing. Of course, if it's the right thing and the right director and the, the right everything. Yeah, of course. Uh, okay. Then what would because, be. Because what, what I was going to say, what I was going to say about the kind of films that are being made, it strikes me that the whole, the, the sort of films that I spent most of my career making with a mid range budget. Right. You know, I started off with a really, really low, the Derek Darman ends, the really low, low, low budgets, which are great when you're starting out and great when you're young, you can't, you, it's difficult to maintain that for an entire career. Sure. Um, but I, so I did the mid range, you know, the Neil Jordan film. So the films of a middle scale, most of the period films, this sort of middle, middle bracket budget. But now that has completely disappeared. It's either, the student budget or the mega budget there right. is very little in between if you could design your ultimate what what is your ultimate dream project ah uh, that's a difficult one i don't know i mean it would be it probably would be a period uh do you know what but period? a period where with a heightened reality i guess i guess my ultimate thing is 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 absolutely based in a period where we can stylize it a little and it's you know great writing a great director and a great sure. car, and great you know production designer great cinematographer makeup i mean obviously for me one of the most important things is was working with hair and makeup artists who are compatible you know because that, that's the most important thing because they, they, you have to work really closely with them to complete the look. It's it's hopeless if you work with um, hair, you know, hair designer who's off doing their own thing that's completely different from you. Then you've right. got a you've got a head that doesn't match a body. Well, I mean, you know? that was something that, that I didn't I didn't ask you about, but collaboration. I've I've often said on the show, the the director of photography, the production designer, and what you do has to be simpatico. Yeah. In terms of like, you can't be making costumes that don't work in the environments that you're shooting in. You, you, no, you know, you exactly. have, to have that kind of, and that's one of the great things I think about cinema is that you're, you're collaborating with other great artists who are trying to do the same things you're doing in, in their yeah. milieu, which is. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I mean, the best, best end products come from when every single person has done their absolute best but it's all come together perfectly, you know, and everybody's working with everyone else. I mean, it really does show if there's one, you know, there's one area that's not fitting in and not working. Absolutely. Not well, Sandy Powell, I want to thank you uh, for this. It has been such an honor to speak with you today. And um, look, I know, I know you're working on uh, Snow White and you, you, you're getting close to the end. You can't tell us anything about it <laughs> but my god was it a great honor to speak with you and i know this is a long time coming and uh what a delightful conversation we've had thank you so much for being on the designing hollywood podcast and i i for one as a huge fan of your work i can't wait to see what you're going to conjure up next thank you very much and a very special thanks to our sponsor paris costumes Paris Costumes has been a part of the history of the European theater, film, and television industry since 1856 and became 21st century tailors. They are known for being experts in hiring and producing costumes of all periods. Paris Costumes' aim is to become a 21st century costume house through innovation while maintaining the standards of tradition and quality gained over years since 1856. They offer a variety of services, fabrics, accessory samples, leather work, hats, shoes, uniforms, period pieces. Paris Costumes, a costume rental house for film and television. A special thanks to our producer and founder, Martika Ibarra, and of course, our co-founder, legendary costume designer, Marilyn Vance, and our new partner, John Campia of the John Campia YouTube channel. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification button and you can find the Designing Hollywood podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Also on iTunes. Follow me, Robert Meyer Burnett, on Instagram, on Twitter at BurnettRM or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. Thanks for watching. We very much appreciate it.